Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. So one of the big stories in generative AI, especially over the past three years, has been this dramatic improvement in their ability to generate code. In particular, there was a real turning point back in 2022 when suddenly, uh, DeepMind demonstrated a system called AlphaCode that was actually capable of placing over the 50th percentile on a programming competition, right? And this was regarded as a real milestone. And it led to a lot of questions and a lot of concern about the future of our need for programmers. Are people still going to be able to make a living by writing code? It's programming still a worthwhile skill for people to acquire in this new world where people are, uh, where AI now has these dramatic abilities to write code that even for expert programmers is actually quite hard to write. And so these set of concerns, we can actually break them into two kinds of questions. The first question concerns the actual capabilities of these AI systems. Right? Um, are we actually at the stage where we really should be worrying about these things? And so on the surface, the coding capabilities of this system are really, really good. Right? Here's an example, for example, of the kind of code that AlphaCode can actually write. And I don't expect you to actually see the details of this code, but just to notice how much code this is, right? This is a complicated, intricate algorithm and a tricky piece of code that the system is actually able to produce completely on its own, right? But we need to look beyond the anecdote to actually understand how deep are the coding capabilities of these models, right? So looking at the headline, you might think that alpha code is actually really, really good at solving these programming competition problems. But if you look at the actual success rate at solving these problems, it turns out that this is actually around 34%, right? So if you have a startup and you think you can get away with having only 34% of your code work, then congratulations. If not, I think you might still need some people to help you with this code. The other thing to note is that in order to get to this 34%, the model was actually uh, generating a million samples, right? The model was actually producing a million programs, and out of the uh, million-sized pile of garbage, you know, one good solution comes out. So not, uh, not necessarily as impressive, unless, of course, you recognize that a year before, if anybody had told me that a system would be able to solve one of these problems, let alone 34% of them, I would have been quite skeptical. Uh, so there's no question that there is something really powerful in these models. But one of the things that is important to understand is that these models are not like real programmers. And in particular, when we look at real people who write code, their ability to solve complex programming problems implies a certain set of skills that, as a person, you can't solve a challenging programming problem if you can't read and understand code, for example. You can't solve a challenging programming problem, but you can't look at a piece of code and debug it if there's something wrong with it. Or, or even if you can't stare at a piece of code for a little while and say, oh, yep, there's a mistake here. This is actually not going to do the right thing. And it's very tempting to believe that, well, since LLMs can also solve these complex programming problems, they must have the same capabilities. Um, and so we've actually been looking in the lab at some of these questions. For example, can these models actually understand simple pieces of code? Um, I happen to have participated in this uh, paper with uh, some collaborators at uh, Meta, led by my student, Alex Gu. And one of the questions we had was, can you take simple little pieces of code that these models have never seen before? And just ask them to figure out what the output is going to be given some input. And you'd be surprised at the kind of failures you observe, right? Even a model like GPT-4 is making the kind of mistakes that you wouldn't necessarily expect from a first-year programming student, right? Misunderstanding 
what it means for a condition and another condition to be satisfied in order to produce an output. But the thing that was really interesting is that GPT-4, despite the fact that it makes these incredibly unexpected errors, is actually way, way better than pretty much every other model we tried, right? Even models that purport to be at parity with GPT-4 when it comes to a lot of programming skill benchmarks turn out to be actually quite bad at this task of reasoning through these four or five line programs and reasoning about what their output is. Similarly, with the question of can AI debug code, we've seen a lot of anecdotal evidence of people saying, well, yeah, it produced this wrong code, but then I go and I tell the system, hey, this code was wrong, it failed this test, and the system comes back and fixes it, right? That's debugging, uh, we can do it. Um, the models seem to be able to do it too. But when you look at this question, you first have to ask, uh, you know, how do we know that it's actually debugging the code or that it's actually any good at it? And a good baseline to compare it is what happens if you just ask the model from scratch to generate another solution? Uh, maybe it just rolled the dice and got the wrong answer once, and then you roll the dice again and it gets the right answer the next time, right? And so we actually explored this in some detail and at a very high level. What we found was, for example, for GPT 3.5, uh, this is essentially what runs ChatGPT. If you look at uh, these normalized by how much it costs to actually draw these samples, it turns out that asking it to repair its own mistakes is no better than asking it to just roll the dice again and see if it gets something that works. With GPT-4, you see a little bit of an improvement, but we're talking about 1% or 2% here. We're not talking about, oh, so now I can fire all my programmers. One of the things that was surprising is that the bottleneck really seems to be in the ability of the model to recognize what the problem is, right? And in fact, if we use a more powerful model to recognize what the problem is, then it actually performs better compared to the baseline code. But here's the result that was actually really surprising. If instead of having a model tell you what's wrong with the code. You have a human stare at the code and tell the model what's wrong with the code. Then suddenly, you see a big improvement compared to the ability of the model alone to solve the problem. And I think this goes part of the way towards explaining why when you are uh, testing these models in the lab, they really don't look so great. But yet, when people actually use them, they actually find incredible productivity improvement. They really like using these tools. I really like using these tools, right? And that is because we're not just letting the code go and make its own decisions and run the code. We're using it as a support for an expert who can actually read the code and can actually work with it, right? And we find similar things when we look at other skills, like can the models identify their mistakes? It seems like, oh, sure. Um, Sometimes it gets the right answer, and sometimes it gets the wrong answer. But a lot of times, these wrong answers look like this, right? And you don't need a very fancy model to tell you that all of those solutions are wrong, right? So the fact that it can tell that those solutions are wrong is not that surprising. But when you focus on solutions that kind of look correct but are not, it turns out that the ability of most of these models to tell them apart is actually just a little bit better than chance. GPT-4, again, does better than most of the other models, but it's still very far from what you could, would consider acceptable. And so the lesson here is that these language models are really different from human programmers. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not going to see dramatic productivity improvements, right? But one of the th quest big differences between writing code and almost any other enterprise is the fact that when we're writing code, the only thing we need are skilled experts, right? We don't need other material inputs. We don't need you know, lots of land or lots of um, other resources. So if those inputs become uh, 10 times more productive, we can write 10 times as much code. And believe me, we could do very well with 10 times as much code, as long 
as we actually invest those additional resources in building this code to a higher quality standard than a lot of what we have today. So thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.